Hello, welcome to AT and the Classroom Environment. My name is Jerry Schaefer, and I'm an educational consultant with the Capital Area Intermediate Unit in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. My colleague, Shauna Montgomery, and I have developed the following module as part of the Tier 1 assistive technology process. This process was designed to build capacity in assistive technology within our local school districts and cooperating agencies. Each module is designed to provide information about best practice in AT. So let's get started with AT and the classroom environment. Before we begin, I'd like to point out that we provided you with some materials with this module, and there's an article entitled Arranging the Classroom Environment. I would like for you to read that article before listening to the modules so that you can have some ideas about what we're going to talk about before we actually go through the module. Okay, so what is classroom environment? Well, the classroom environment can mean many things, but we're gonna start with the physical arrangement. One of the things that I liked about arranging the classroom environment article is that it talked about um, the seating, the lighting, and the personalization of your classroom and what that means for student learning and what it also means for student expression and attitude. So if you look at the examples that I have up here, I have three examples of classroom arrangement. And the first one on the left is sort of a traditional arrangement. It's just um, student desks all in a row facing the front of the classroom with, and in the front of the classroom is podium and some chalkboards. So if you had to guess, what type of learning do you think you're going to be doing in this? Um, no, let me rephrase that. What type of teaching do you think is going to be happening in this setting? So if you guessed lecture, then you were correct because this is definitely the type of setting where students sit and they listen to the teacher. And that's what's expected of them. When you walk into a classroom that's arranged this way, that's what you think is going to happen. This type of classroom does not lend itself to student collaboration, movement, even the lighting in this classroom um, may affect behavior or mood for a student. Doesn't exactly lend itself to good, to being a good learning environment. Now in the second example, the classroom in the middle, we have the desks arranged completely different. So the desks are arranged sort of in a circle with the student chairs all around. And I really love this example because it is a collaborative type of classroom. So you're not gonna be, as soon as you walk in here, you know you're not going to be lectured to, that you're going to be sitting, facing your peers. And I really like the idea that it promotes um, peer interaction and it allows students to feel valued and encourages them to value the opinions and the contributions of others. So I really like, um, this type of environment. It also allows for a little more movement than the other classroom around the perimeter of the of the desks. Um, and I believe, I mean, it's hard to tell in the picture, but it looks to me like even a wheelchair could navigate around this area. Now in the third example, if I had to choose one word to describe this picture, I think it would be exploration or independence because in this you don't really see student chairs in a line or in a circle there's sort of flexible seating throughout the room and if you look closely you can see there are bins and books and materials that students are encouraged to go and get and then sit down you know in a chair that's comfortable for them in a space that they're ready to learn in and do some independent work. So I really like that setup. I really like seeing um, there's this sort of barrier. It looks like maybe the back of a bookshelf with a plant on it. 
Um, one thing I will point out is you have to be careful that all, you wanna make sure all of your students are, um, that you can see all of your students in the room. So that type of barrier, if a student is able to get back there behind there and you can't see what they're doing, that could create a situation where there's behaviors that you don't want. Um, however, if maybe your desk is back there and it's creating a barrier from things like your computer and your paperwork and things students shouldn't be touching, then that's the perfect place for it. Um, and bringing plants into your room or decorating your room in a way that's valuable to you, that um, makes your personality sort of come through, I think is really important. You're in your classroom um, for many, many hours a week, and it should be a space that you feel comfortable in. And if you feel comfortable in your classroom space and it's reflecting things that you enjoy, then your attitude is going to um, be passed on to the students. The fact that you like being there and you enjoy your classroom is going to rub off and students are going to pick up on that and then they're going to enjoy it and be want to be part of that classroom as well. Okay, so the desks and the materials, all the equipment, um, you want to make sure that you're making them easily accessible to everyone in the classroom. I know in the article, they talked about things like bottlenecking. You know, if you put materials in only one place, you have all students possibly getting up all at one time and going and getting those materials. So how could you avoid that? Maybe you could break up the materials into different parts of the room, or you could have, um, you know, kids separated into sort of classroom teams so that only maybe four at a time are going over to, to to one area or one space. So I thought the article did a nice job talking about the physical arrangement of the classroom, the importance of where the seating is, where the lighting is, um, what the expectations not only for learning but socially might be. In addition to talking about physical arrangement of your classroom, it's important to talk about the academic mindset when you're talking about classroom environment. Now, what is the academic mindset? It really means that you are expecting students to come to school and learn. And in many of our classrooms, we have a lot of functional skills that we're teaching. So activities of daily living skills, you know, things like um, executive functioning type skills, um, learning how to bathroom, learning how to manage materials, learning um, how to put your coat on and off. And those are all great skills, but I still think that there it's there needs to be an expectation for academic material now i like this hierarchy of learner needs because i feel like it really expresses or you know puts a, a visual to what we're talking about if you look at the bottom of the pyramid you see the physiological needs food safety and love we know that many of our students have a lot of physiological needs. Um, many of our students with complex bodies um, have difficulty eating, they have difficulty drinking, and they have difficulty sleeping. So when they come into school, many of them are very tired, they're dehydrated, and they're hungry. And until that, those needs are taken care of, they're not going to be in a place where they can learn. The same is true for safety. If students do not feel physically and emotionally safe in your classroom, then learning cannot happen. And the love aspect is not only, you know, loving and caring for your, your student, but also making them feel valued, making them feel like you want to interact with them. Um, them having interactions with their peers is all part of love. So 
these three things are absolute. We need them. We can't um, disregard them. We must start with them. And we want to make sure our students have a nice foundation with these physiological needs so that they can then move up to a learning mindset. Now, I just want to say one thing very quickly. I go into many classrooms and um, I understandably see us getting stuck in this physiological area. And the reason why is because there's not that many hours in a school day. And by the time, you know, these kids who are have complex bodies and who are in wheelchairs and need a lot of time and attention from adults, um, by the time you get them off the bus and get their things put away and you might have to bathroom them and make sure they, they've they eaten and, um, you know, say hello to them and get them socially sort of adjusted to the classroom, before you know it, it's lunchtime. And then, you know, they're going to the lunchroom and that's a whole process getting them there and getting them back. And then there's not a whole lot of time before you have to get all of their things packed up again and get them on the bus and they go home. So there's very few moments in the day where academic learning is even possible. And some of the functional learning can sort of happen along the way, but when you're being pulled out for speech therapy or occupational therapy or physical therapy, that also impedes your ability to academically, you know, to inject academic learning. So I get it and I, it's completely understandable in some of our classrooms, but we still need to try our best to find ways to meet these needs without spending all day doing it. We want to make sure that there are times in the day when the students are ready to leave that physiological place and get up into the learning mindset. Now, the learning mindset is basically learning readiness, where kids believe that they can learn and that they're here in the classroom to do that. And then they can get ready um, to understand learning strategies and habits and you know, maybe what's good for them and the things that they need to learn. And then finally, once they've got that sort of learning mindset going and those good strategies and habits, then you can get into quality instruction and guidance and experiences that are truly academic in nature, whether it's reading or math or science. The learning mindset means that they believe they belong in a learning community, that your students believe they can change through effort. If they work hard, they can learn something, that they can succeed, and that the work that they're doing has value and purpose for them. So coming to school and just getting your needs taken care of and then going home doesn't have that same value for students who came there to learn. Um, so just keep that in mind and keep in mind that not only does a classroom environment mean the physical arrangement, but it means academically, what are you expecting and are you presuming competence? After looking closely at the physical arrangement and the ac academic mindset of your classroom, we want to move on to the social expectations of your class. So when students are in your classroom, there's a lot of social expectations and social rules that need to be followed. Students need to know how to interact with each other. They need to know how to interact with adults. And um, they also need to do things, need to know some of the social rules, such as how do they get the teacher's attention? What if they need to go to the bathroom? Um, how to say nice things to each other and make positive comments about each other. So these are all the social expectations for students and they need, for young children, they need to be explicitly taught 
they need to be modeled all the time in the classroom. And typically, a teacher is going to spend a large part of the beginning of their year making sure that these social expectations are in place. So as students get older and they've had more experience with social rules in the classroom, this takes less time. Uh, however, you still want, you don't want to assume that they know the social expectations of your classroom. So you want to make sure that you put those out there and model them again and make sure you're explicitly teaching those social expectations to the students. The other aspect of social expectations that I want to talk about today are the adults in the room and what the expectations are for them. So we know that in our special needs classrooms, there are a lot of adults in the room. We have classroom aides, personal care aides, nurses, speech therapists, occupational therapists, physical therapists, lots of adults coming and going. And I think it's really important to set down the social expectations um, pretty quickly in the beginning of your uh, school year so that the adults know what's expected of them. You want to possibly have uh, regular meetings about the social expectations in the classroom. And you want to talk about things like what's expected of the adults when they're in the classroom, how they should be interacting with the students, and how the students should be interacting with them. You want to make sure that they aren't interrupting you when you're teaching or possibly um, answering questions for the students. Many times, um, Adults mean well, but they want to help the student and they're giving them some direction that might be um, more than what the prompt hierarchy calls for. So you want to make sure adults have those rules in place and, you know, know the expectations. And as long as we're talking about prompt hierarchies, I highly, highly recommend that you have um, prompt hierarchies discussed in your classroom and possibly even visibly um, posted somewhere in your class so that all the adults in the room know what to expect in terms of how much prompting they can give a student and when they should be backing down from that prompting. So all of these social expectations are going on all day throughout your classroom. And when everything's going well, you, you see good behavior, you see lots of learning going on. But if you don't take the time to model and explicitly teach these social rules, um, you might have you might run into some challenges. So what we would like to see are students who are you know, learning and having fun and enjoying being at school. And I think explicitly teaching and modeling those social expectations is really important. After looking at these three areas of the classroom environment, the physical arrangement, the academic mindset, and the social expectations, we want to be asking ourselves, why is the classroom environment important? And very quickly, there are four really um, basic answers. First, it's important for safety. We want to make sure that students are physically and emotionally safe. And this may seem like a given and you think, oh, my classroom is safe and that's, you know, it's not an issue. However, I really want you to think about um, that physical safety, making sure that everything in the room um, is age appropriate, that students can't be pulling bookcases down on top of them or, um, you know, using any of the equipment in the room in a way that could hurt them. But also I want you to think about them, their emotional safety. So we talked about the social expectations for adults, and I think this is really important in this emotional safety part. 
because when adults talk about students in front of their peers, they don't always feel, um, they're not always promoting emotional safety with that student. Students need to know that when they come in, they have an environment where all the adults in the room are going to respect them, are going to value what they have to say, and also that if they fail or they make a mistake that they're not going to be ridiculed or somehow embarrassed. So it's really important that you think about the safety features of your classroom. Um, the other, you know, obvious thing that happens when we're looking at our um, classroom environment is that it increases good behavior. So if you have a good classroom environment, you're going to have better behavior. And we know that we spend a lot of time on behavior with our students and it takes away from learning and it takes away from teaching. So we want to make sure that um, we're setting up our classroom for, for good behavior. The social aspects, of course, as we've talked about already, and most importantly, the learning. You know, we are a classroom and we want our students to be learning. And so if we can't, if we're spending all of our time on these other issues, then students, it's less time for us to actually teach students um, something and, and stay in that academic mindset. After taking some time to think about our classroom environment in terms of physical arrangement, academic mindset, and the social expectations, we want to ask ourselves, where does AT fit in? This is the tier one process. So we're looking at your overall classroom and what you have available for all students so that they can um, meet your expectations. Now, this is a uh, protocol that I've developed as a speech language pathologist, and I call it the all access pass protocol. And basically pass breaks down into four areas, participation, accessibility, social integration, and self-reliance or self-advocacy. And the idea here is that you wanna make sure that you're covering all four of these areas when it comes to assistive technology and where assistive technology could fit in. So the first area is participation. What are you asking your students to do to participate in your activities or your lesson or your classroom? And when you really break down the tasks they need to perform, you want to be able to say, can they perform those tasks? And if they can't, then what supports can I be put into place? So for participation, um, it may be something like getting the teacher's attention using a Big Mac switch. It may be um, writing uh, using a computer. It may be reading using specialized audio equipment. What, part, what are you asking the students to do to participate in the activity and how are they being actively engaged in that activity? The second piece is accessibility. And it basically means how are, are the students accessing the curriculum and the classroom, um, physically accessing it. So do they need a switch in order to, um, access a piece of equipment or do they need a computer to access reading and writing um, do they need uh, a wheelchair or a stander to move around the classroom um, what are those accessibility pieces have you arranged your classroom so that all students can access materials in your classroom that all students can participate in a way that um, you're expecting. The next one is social integration. We've already talked a lot about social expectations. We are social people and our classrooms are social places. And so once those social rules and expectations are put into place, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that, that students are actually, actually have the tools to be social, to interact with each other, and to interact with adults. Um, that 
could mean a communication device or a communication board of some kind uh, if students are unable to speak. Uh, the next piece is the self-reliance or self-advocacy piece. So when you're setting up your classroom and you're setting up your curriculum, you want to make sure that any expectation you have the student can be done as independently as possible. We don't want adults always leading the um, participation or the social integration. We want to make sure that students can independently get their own materials, complete their own work, um, socially interact with others without being told or directed by an adult. Now, many of our students, especially students with complex bodies, um, you know, if we have a student who is in a wheelchair and can barely move their body, uh, much less, you know, get their own piece, paper and pencil or um, get the attention of a, a, of a teacher, we know that that self-reliance piece is not going to be the same at, you know, as maybe some other more able-bodied kids. However, that's where that self-advocacy piece comes in. We want these students, if they can't do it themselves because they're not physically able, we want them to use their self-advocacy skills and learn how to ask for help, ask for what they need, direct an adult, and make sure that adult understands the, their needs, the best way for them to learn um, or the things that they want in their environment. So if you put all of these pieces together, you'll see that really everything we've talked about so far in the module kind of is wrapped up in this all access pass. If, if you can remember the participation, accessibility, social integration, and self-reliance pieces, your student will have an all access pass to your classroom. When we're thinking about assistive technology in your classroom environment, I think the All Access Pass is an important way for us to um, evaluate what it is we're doing, what we're doing in the classroom. So I put together this little protocol um, that breaks down the four areas and gives you some guiding questions. And on this protocol, you would put in some examples of ways in which you're, you are providing that for students. And if you get stuck on something, then maybe assistive technology could help and you could reach out and you know ask for ideas. So this um, All Access Pass protocol is going to be available through the module and you can download that and use it if you'd like to in your classroom. So we've come to the end of this module on assistive technology and the classroom environment. I hope that you got some ideas about your classroom and how to arrange it both physically um, and academically and also putting in that social piece and how you can use the All Access Pass protocol to determine where assistive technology might help. So thank you very much for taking the time to complete this module. Please remember to complete the reflection questions and review the extra materials provided. If you have any questions about this module or you would like to discuss your role in the AT process, please feel free to call me or my colleague Shauna Montgomery. Um, our contact information can be found at this website address. Uh, please remember that we are available for in-person training and consultation with your team. Thank you and have a great day.